Well, good evening, everyone. <laughs> good evening. Welcome. Lovely to see you all here at Barkhead Free Church this evening. And a real special welcome to you if you're um, new here, either in person or perhaps watching online. We know that the current COVID circumstances make it a little bit harder for us to be able to meet in person as much as we'd like, as much as we know that that is the ideal. However, we are really, really glad to see you. If you've made it here or if you've made it online, we're really glad that you can join with us. Um, before we begin, uh, some quick notices from uh, me for our church families. Um, firstly, you'll have received a, an email from, from Peter, our minister, explaining some new things that we're going to have going on at the church in this coming term, including our Passion for Life evangelistic events coming up at the end of um, March, I think, into February, or February into March. Um, all of that is really important information that we want you to know and we want you to um, have a good grasp of and, and to pray about as well. If you haven't received that email, you can pick up a physical copy of um, the contents of the email at the back on your way out. Um, please, please do make sure that you're up to date with all that's going on this term. Grab a copy of the details at the back. Something else you can grab at the back as well on your way out uh, are some of these uh, Gideon's Bibles that are being uh, left um, they, are, they are free and they are available for you to take away and use as and when you will. Secondly, small groups. Again, you'll have heard all about this already, but in short, they're going to kick off this Wednesday night. We'll be meeting on Zoom, but in micro groups of three households all joining in from different places. Um, you should have heard from your small group leader about all of this um, and you'll know, hopefully, what's going on this week. But if not, and you'd like to ask some questions, please talk to me, talk to Peter. And um, we're really, really glad to be of help in that way. And we're really glad that, ultimately, we can keep meeting together as small groups to encourage one another, to support one another in our Christian walk and our faith. So please do make sure that you go to your small group. Thirdly, and lastly... Um, a quick reminder that uh, Hope Explored begins this Thursday, the 13th, at 7.30 p.m. here uh, in the church. It will be set up as COVID guidance allows and should be a really, really good time together exploring what hope the gospel message might or could possibly even have for us in our daily lives today. If you're not coming along or you don't know of anyone coming along, please do pray for that meeting It'll be a really, really good chance for some of us, uh, some of our friends or some of those in our um, local community to hear the gospel or think about it afresh, anew, or th again or for the first time. So please do pray about that and remember that. Well, listening to God speak to us as his word is preached and proclaimed is a great privilege that we get to enjoy. It's the highlight of our time together when we gather as a church family. And so as we look forward to that, as, as Paul, one of our elders, comes to preach to us later on, we'll remember, we'll be preparing, and we'll be um, thinking more deeply in our hearts about the truths of the gospel as we sing together, as we pray together, and as we read God's word together. We'll be back in Mark's gospel this evening, continuing to think about what it means to follow the king. And so just before we sing, let me read um, from Paul's letters, not this Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, to the Philippians as he speaks of Jesus, our King. Here's what he says about him. He says, Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's our king. Surprisingly, but wonderfully, humble, faithful in service to his father and to us. Would our lives reflect the pattern and the manner of his more and more? There is no one like him. Well, let's sing of him together. Let's stand. <clears throat>
please do take a seat. Well, we're going to pray together now. Uh, Abby, one of our members, <laughs> is going to lead us in that, and then Gavin will come up to read uh, our scripture uh, for today. Thank you, Abby. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that you are perfectly good. We thank you that you are completely holy and pure, never tainted in the slightest by evil or sin. We thank you that you're compassionate and loving, caring for the world and the people you've made. We thank you for sending Jesus. When we could not approach you because of our sin, you came to us in your son and by his death in our place brought to yourself all those who trust him. We thank you for the good news of God with us and the great hope we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, of us being with you forever. Merciful Father, you know how often we forget your goodness, worthiness and love, and we wander from you. We get distracted or discouraged by what's immediately in front of us, and forget to look to you. Would you graciously forgive us and help us to see and know you, and live in a way that acknowledges and reflects who you really are. At the start of a new year, would you guide our plans and actions in ways that please you? Would you draw near to those in our church family who are not looking forward to the year ahead, whether that's because of loss, ill health or any other reason? Would you bring comfort and hope and assurance of your loving presence? As we gather in peace and safety to worship and learn from your word, we pray for brothers and sisters around the world who face opposition and persecution for their faith. We particularly bring before you your people in China and India who seem to be facing increasing pressure from the state and lawmakers. Please may you change the hearts and minds of those in power to allow greater freedom and security for your church. Please would you strengthen and encourage your people and would the gospel continue to spread and bear fruit. Father God, as we come to your word tonight, would you teach us, would you change us, would you help us to know you better as you truly are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our reading tonight is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, starting at verse 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man. 
Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. The Lord will bless the reading of his word to our hearts. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Gavin. Well, just before um, Paul comes to preach to us from that passage, we're going to sing once more a, a psalm this time that invites us to consider the grandeur and the worthiness of our King. Let's stand and sing together. Light forth in state victoriously for me. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> I hope it's not uh, too late for me to be wishing you a happy new year. Um, and uh, I wonder what it is that you might be excited about for the year to come. And for me, there's something that gets my juices flowing. Um, I suspect that more than 90% of you won't share my enthusiasm for this, but this is the year of the Qatar Football World Cup in November. I've got one thumbs up. You're the you're the three percent or whatever it is, Joe, Jamie. Um, now it's going to be a World Cup like no other. Uh, the temperatures, although they've shifted the whole thing, it was going to be in June, but it was going to be too hot. People would be dying on the field, so they've shifted it to November. But despite that, the temperatures are going to be enormous. There are allegations of corruption and bribery and human rights abuses in Qatar that still haven't gone away. And uh, the whole thing is going to take place whilst all the European um, football seasons are right bang in the middle of their, their proper seasons. So that's going to be a huge management headache for all the football associations of Europe. Um, so... Qatar as well, on top of all that, it has no experience of running uh, full-scale, world-level, international sporting events, apart from, some of you will be quick to remind me afterwards if I didn't say this, uh, Formula One, which it's recently got into. So the challenge is going to be huge, and it's not going to work without the right people in the right place doing the right jobs. A team of dedicated people, people who can get the job done, committed people for something as big as the World Cup to work. Well, something massive is going to happen in Mark's gospel. 
Back at the beginning of Mark's account, uh, Jesus declares, chapter 1, verse 15, he says, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And to the Jews Jesus was speaking to, that would have been momentous news, welcome news, good news. And in fact, it still is today. And as the title of our sermon series suggests, On Your Marks, we need to be on our marks and ready to go. The kingdom of God was something foreshadowed in the Old Testament. It was pictured and lived in the lives of the ancestors of the Jewish people. It was prophesied in ancient scriptures. And living as they were under an oppressive Roman rule, it was something that they were all longing for. The kingdom of God was coming. So what sort of kingdom was it going to be? Who would be in it? And who would be out of it? Who was going to be ruling it? How is it going to be established? How is it going to work? And those are questions that I think were on the minds of everybody uh, around Jesus at that time. And it seems from our passage today that actually most of the people had the wrong impression about the kingdom that Jesus came to establish, about the kingdom he still rules over today. The disciples... Well, they're on board with the whole idea. Jesus is going to be in the kingdom, and he's chosen them to help him do it. Great, they thought. But they had no idea what that meant. The discussion between Jesus and the disciples, James and John, in our passage today, it clearly shows that. They've no idea. The kingdom was coming. So they thought, surely... Well, that's going to take some organizing, isn't it? Some personnel structure, a team of dedicated people, the kind of people who can get the job done, committed people. We're going to overthrow Rome, and there's going to be a battle going on. What sort of team do we need to be gathered to achieve that feat, to bring in the kingdom of God? I'm pretty sure that's the sort of things that were going through their minds when we find them here in Mark chapter 10. Jesus was going to bring in the kingdom of God and he had appointed an organizational committee of 12 people to help him get the job done. That's how we work today, isn't it? We get committees up. That's the way things work. And Jesus has his advisory committee all in place, his 12 disciples. Or at least that's how they perhaps understood it. Which explains, I think, why Mark sets the scene for us here the way he does at the start of the Bible reading. They're on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus is leading the way. And the disciples, well, they're part astonished and part afraid. The disciples have listened to him enough to know this was going to be a big deal. Jesus had spoken about his death He'd spoken about the kingdom coming. He'd spoken about going up to Jerusalem. It was all coming to a climax. It was going to happen soon. But as they walk, well, they're not really sure what it all means. They're not quite sure what their role in any of it is going to be. What are they going to have to do to make sure that the kingdom of God arrived and was established? How are they supposed to help Jesus out? And the only problem with that way of thinking is that Jesus, of course, didn't need any help at all. And in fact, if they'd been listening to him, maybe more carefully, they would have understood that they weren't going to do anything except watch and receive. Do you remember um, back in chapter 9, right at the start, Jesus told the crowds which included his disciples, I tell you the truth. Some of you who are standing here will not taste death before you see the kingdom of God come with power. Do you notice how he describes it there? They're simply going to see the kingdom come. They're not going to do anything about it. They're going to watch 
It's God who does the work. We're just spectators when it comes to bringing the kingdom of God. And we've seen just before today's passage, Jesus tells the disciples that only someone who receives the kingdom like a, a, a child, a little child, will actually end up being part of it. Receive it like little children, dependent children, children with nothing to offer, children who just receive what they're given by loving parents. You see, if the disciples had really listened to Jesus, they would have known that they weren't actually going to be involved in bringing the kingdom at all. With man, it's impossible. But with God, well, all things are possible with God. And Jesus is heading to Jerusalem to do it all himself. But the disciples, they don't get it. They're on their way to Jerusalem for this big moment. And the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, they come to him in verse 35 and they say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Don't you find that an astonishing demand? Imagine what you'd say if you've got children at home, if, if the kids came up to you and said, uh, uh, Mum, Dad, um, uh, just sit down a minute. We've got something we want to, uh, to ask of you. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. I wonder how that would go down in your family. And yet these disciples, James and John, the, the two ordinary men who'd come to realize that in, in some sense anyway, they understood that Jesus was the king, and they stroll up to Jesus, and they say, hey, Jesus, write us a blank check. Would you just, just, just sign your name? Up? Yeah, that's right, just there. That's great. Thanks, Jesus. Uh, we'll fill in the details later. You, don't you worry about it. We're here for you, Jesus. We're willing to play our part in this whole venture, you know, this kingdom coming thing. But before we get to Jerusalem, before things start getting a bit, well, you know, heavy, a bit difficult, uh, we just want to make sure we've got some guarantees in place. Thanks. We we want to make sure this is all going to be worth it for us. And amazingly, and I can only imagine with incredible patience, Jesus says to them, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And that's a really important question for us in understanding this whole section of Mark's gospel. Now, what they want is glory. They want glory for themselves. They want to be able to bask in Jesus' glory. When the time comes, yes, yeah, we're glory hunters. And the different reactions to that explicit desire and manipulation and attempt to, to gain glory, well, they're quite interesting. Jesus' response is to say, you know what? You don't even know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're asking. And actually what you're asking for isn't mine to give. And the rest of the disciples, well, they're not very happy with James and John, are they? In fact, they're quite angry with them. Now, is that because they're a bit frustrated? You know, um, Jesus has told them they're going to Jerusalem. What a nerve, James and John. He's going to die there. I mean, how could you be so unsympathetic and insensitive? Hey, how could you be so focused on yourselves? I mean, well, it's possible that that's what they were thinking and that's why they were angry. But I suspect that that's not it. I suspect their anger is because James and John got in first. They got their demand in first. That's what's bothering them. They wanted that glory. That seat was supposed to be my seat. I was going to Jerusalem to show Jesus exactly what I can offer, well, I, I, what I'm worthy of. I, they just got in first. I can't believe it. Huh. You see, none of the disciples seem to really get what Jesus is on about at all. What do you want me to do for you? And then Mark tells us about a blind man, Bartimaeus. 
Whether he's been blind the whole of his life or whether it's some kind of disease or illness, uh, accident, something like that, well, we don't know, but he's blind. And as was common in those days, his only real hope of, uh, uh, of getting by, um, having any help, was to be a beggar. And Bartimaeus has set himself up on a very important and busy road leading to Jerusalem with lots of passers-by. Anyone traveling to Jerusalem from the north would walk past this beggar. And that probably means he got a fair bit of news and information and gossip. I can imagine him sitting there at the side of the road and talking to the people who were coming from Jerusalem or going there and, and saying, what's happening out there? Tell me the news. What, what are people talking about? And if you can do that, if you can engage people in a bit of conversation, well, they're more likely to toss a few coins in your direction, aren't they? So I imagine Bartimaeus has heard all about Jesus from passers-by. Perhaps he's heard about some of the miracles that he's performed. Perhaps he'd heard from some of those who'd come down from the north from Galilee about the day when Jesus fed 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. He maybe even spoke to someone who was there, perhaps even shared in that meal. Of course, I'm speculating. We've no idea, but certainly wouldn't be impossible, would it? Not unlikely at all. And it seems certain that Bartimaeus knows something of who Jesus is, something of his reputation as a miracle worker, something of his reputation as the Messiah, as the king, as the one who would bring the kingdom of God. And so, when he hears the crowd coming, and he finds out that it's actually Jesus himself who's finally passing by his way, well, he thinks to himself, this is it. This is my one opportunity. This is my chance, and I'm not going to let it go. Jesus, son of David, he cries out, have mercy on me. And the more people tell him to be quiet and keep it down, the more he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And when he finds out that Jesus has actually stopped in his tracks and is waiting for him to come and talk to him, well, he just leaves everything, doesn't he? He throws his cloak off. He leaves behind the, the basket where the coins have been thrown that day. None of that's important anymore. Forget all that. And he kind of stumbles his way over to Jesus He's blind. He's, he's probably bumping into people. It's awkward. Maybe someone has to help him. But finally, he gets to Jesus. And what does Jesus say to him when he gets there? Well, it is astonishing, really. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? It's exactly the same question that Jesus asked James and John. Uh, and I, there's little doubt that Mark wants us to compare and contrast these two events. He wants us to learn something. The blind man, Bartimaeus, addresses Jesus like this. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. James and John had said, Rabbi, we want you to do whatever we ask. Jesus' response to both of them is exactly the same. What do you want me to do for you? And look at the difference in their replies. James and John, well, they want the glory, as we've said. Bartimaeus, he just wants to be able to see. And Jesus heals his eyes simply with a word. But the reality is this blind man could already see far more than the disciples could. He saw who Jesus really was. He, he knew that Jesus knew what he really needed. Jesus was the son of David, the king, and what, he, what Bartimaeus needed from Jesus was mercy. Bartimaeus saw a whole lot more light that day than the sun's rays coming into those new eyes. He saw the light of the glory of Jesus shining in his heart. You see, the thing is, when we read this story, it's so clear that Mark has arranged it um, in this way because he wants us to realize that
that we're actually with Bartimaeus here. We're blind. The Apostle Paul was told by Jesus later that his task was to preach to the Gentiles so as to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. And later, Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth and he'll say, that God who said, let there be light, referring to the creation of the world, has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, God is in the business of opening the eyes of the blind, not just Bartimaeus's physical eyes, but the disciples' blind eyes, our blind eyes, so that we can see Jesus for whom he really is. He's the son of David. He's the king. Mark wants us to come and see and meet the king, just like Bartimaeus did that day. So here's a question that we need to ask. It's the question Jesus is asking of us today. What do you want me to do for you? So what do you want Jesus to do for you? Is it comfort? Glory? Security? Health? Wealth? Prosperity? Well, if that's the case, then you actually find yourself on the side of the disciples, don't you? And just like the disciples, we've still probably got a lot to learn about the kingdom of God. And we'll come to that in just a second. Or is it mercy you want Jesus to give you? Son of David, have mercy on me. Open my blind eyes so I can see you for who you really are. Let me meet you, the king, and then follow you with all my life. Because it's interesting, as you read this story, you realize, actually, Jesus doesn't need to teach Bartimaeus anything. Bartimaeus understood. He knew exactly what he needed to do. He leaves everything he has. He recognizes Jesus for who he is. He begs for mercy. And when he receives it, he willingly follows Jesus on the road. That's the road to Jerusalem, the road to Jesus' death. Bartimaeus seems to have it all worked out. Jesus doesn't teach him anything in this passage. But the disciples, on the other hand, well, as I said, they've still got a lot to learn about the kingdom of God. And on three different occasions, Jesus takes them to one side to teach them something they haven't quite understood. So if you're finding yourself thinking this evening that your answer to Jesus' question actually, in all honesty, sounds a little bit more like the disciples' answer than Bartimaeus' answer, then perhaps we should look at some of this teaching that Jesus gave the disciples in order to learn too. So just three very quick things. At the start of our passage, on the way to Jerusalem, when the disciples were afraid, Jesus takes them aside and he teaches them. He says, you know what? This isn't about you. It's about me. All this is going to happen to me. We're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man, that's me, I, will be betrayed. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, they're going to condemn me to death. They're going to hand me over to the Gentiles. They're going to mock me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to flog me. They're going to kill me. And on the third day, I will rise from the dead. This is now the third time that Jesus has given the disciples explicit detail about his death. And each time he gives them more and more information. Yep, this is scary. So your emotions of astonishment, of fear, apprehension, they're all the right emotions. But it's me, though. It's my life on the line here, not yours. As I read this, I find tremendous tension in the scene. It's kind of edge of your seat stuff as Jesus heads towards Jerusalem for the culmination of his ministry to bring in and inaugurate this kingdom. And following Jesus meant heart pounding excitement for the disciples. And is it any different for us today? 
Well, the only difference is that for the disciples, it was what was going to happen to Jesus. But for us, it's what has happened to Jesus. But we still share that same mix of emotions, that sense of awe and astonishment, still that, that heart-pounding, edge-of-your-seat stuff. That, that sort of ride that you have when you walk and live with Jesus as your king. It's life in the kingdom of God. And it's scary and exciting and all at the same time, and it's dangerous. And that's the second thing Jesus wants to teach these disciples. It's going to be dangerous for him and for his followers. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm going to go through? Jesus says to James and John, as he speaks about his death and all that he was going to experience. Well, yeah, they say, sure, huh, yeah. But they don't really have any idea what they're talking about. And Jesus says, yeah, you will. You will. James actually will be killed by King Herod, recorded for us in Acts chapter 12. And the Bible doesn't actually say anything about John's death, um, but theologians studying the uh, sort of literature of the time um, generally accept he died on the island of Patmos where he'd been banished. And some even suggest he was thrown into a cauldron of boiling oil because he refused to announce, uh, renounce his faith. But it's dangerous. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus says. Lose your life so as to save it. And that brings us to the third thing that Jesus teaches his disciples and us about the kingdom. And that is that it's an upside-down kind of world. It's an upside-down kingdom. The way things work in our world that, is that those who are on top boss around those who are underneath them, don't they? Anyone who's ever worked in any work situation anywhere knows that. I remember years and years ago, a long time ago, I worked in a textile factory. And uh, when I started, I can remember really clearly being told on the first day, right, lad, your job is to make cups of tea for us. And there were 35 people on the floor. And twice a day, I had to make 35 mugs of tea. They all had to be hot. So, you know, sometimes I get to number 35 and we'll make another one. I had to collect all the cups afterwards and uh, wash them all, stack them away, all by hand. No such thing as dishwashers in those days. Honestly, I am that old. And uh, that was my job. Um, and uh, I was the new boy on the floor, so I did all the scummy stuff until another lad joined the team. Yes. Then I could pass it on to him, right? That's how it works. Those at the bottom do all the uh, jobs until they can find someone else underneath them. That's the way our world works. Rulers lord it over those who are underneath them. But Jesus says no. Not in the kingdom of God. You want to be great? Well, the way it works in the kingdom of God is that you serve. And he holds himself up as an example to take the title of the Son of Man, that great figure from Daniel's prophecy, the one who in Daniel 7 is given all power and authority, the one who rules over all peoples and all nations, that one, the Son of Man, has come to the earth that he rules over, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for those whom he rules. You want to be part of the kingdom of God? You want to have eternal life? Then listen to Jesus. With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You see, the disciples thought they were part of Jesus' organization committee. The ones who are going to get everything done when it came to bringing the kingdom of God. But Jesus didn't need them. They were wrong. There was only one person who was going to do anything about it, and that was God. Working through his servant, the Son of Man. Working through Jesus, the King, as he gave his life as a ransom for you and for me. You want to be part of the kingdom of God, then you have to understand there's nothing you can do. Nothing you can contribute 
There's nothing that God owes you. If you want to be part of the kingdom of God, then come and meet the king. And just like Bartimaeus, sit and beg, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those are the people who are part of the kingdom of God, the ones who accept it like a dependent child, who want to put their faith not in their own efforts, but in the son of man who gave his life. A when England win the World Cup in 2022, there's going to be a lot of joy for me, maybe sorrow for many of you, uh, but my joy will be short-lived. I know the team will probably come home and lose 1-0 to Wales or even Scotland, even worse. Um, but there's another joy to be had that is so much more permanent and life-changing. Um, the regulars here at BFC, we, we long for those around us, out there in our village. We long for them to be part of the kingdom of God. We want people who don't know him to meet the king and ask him for mercy. We long for that because it's real joy, unbreakable joy for eternity. And if you're a part of the kingdom of God already, then let's live like it. Let your life be a little bit exciting. Hey? Take a chance on Jesus because that's what life is like in the kingdom of God. That's what it's supposed to be. Living with Jesus as your king, it means everything. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a church full of greatness? Kingdom people looking for someone to serve. Kingdom people looking for ways to put other people first. Kingdom people looking to be great in God's eyes. Kingdom people wanting to serve their king. What do you want me to do for you? Amen. Thank you, Paul, so much. Well, let's sing and stand uh, in response to what we've heard as we reflect upon these truths we've just been presented with. Jesus, our servant king, does for us what we need him to do for us. Will we want it? Let's stand and sing together. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh.
just as we stand, one last prayer. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain on a cross for us. Worthy is the Lamb to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing to him who sits on a throne and to the Lamb who served be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please do take a seat. Thank you.